uh, Nicole Bazemore, Justin Collins, and Arabella Murray uh, all wanted um, our take, but they're going to get my take, on uh, a recent study that was published um, and an NPR article about it. So the study and the NPR article will both be linked in the show notes. The title of the For the record, by the way, uh, I've already weighed in on this topic, but I keep all of my perspectives behind a paywall. So you got to subscribe to Mass (laughs) if you want my take on artificial sweeteners. All right. Uh, Anyway, so the title of the study in question... uh, published, I think, last month or in October, um, was Obesity and Sex-Related Associations with Differential Effects of Sucralose versus Sucrose on Appetite and Reward Processing, colon, a randomized control trial. And I got to say, most of the time when when a study gets a lot of headlines and a lot of press, it tends to have a very uh, simple and audacious title. So kudos to these researchers for getting an NPR spot for this paper, because that's a convoluted title. Um, But anyway, so uh, what this study did is there were three conditions. Um, So subjects consumed water, a sucralose sweetened beverage. Sucralose is the generic associated with the brand named Splenda uh, and a sucrose sweetened beverage. So sucrose is table sugar. Uh, And it was a crossover study. So all of the subjects completed the same testing after consuming water, after consuming a sucralose sweetened beverage, and after consuming a sucrose sweetened beverage with a washout period between each one. And uh, I'll note most of the outcomes in this study were related to brain imaging. And I'm not going to even touch on those because that's not even even within spitting distance of my area of expertise. Um, yeah, I don't know the first thing about fMRI. I understand in general what it's measuring, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a neurology expert. I can't claim to uh, be able to interpret those outcomes with any meaningful expertise. So I'm just gonna let them be. Uh, I uh, did one very MRI heavy study as a grad student, but would you even believe that I was not the MRI expert on the team? Interesting. Yeah. So unfortunately I also cannot comment. Yes. But what I am good at is arithmetic and, uh, knowing dude, you're, you're as good knowing at, when numbers are bigger or smaller. <laughs> I was going to say you're as good at addition and subtraction as virtually any of my peers. I'll take it. Um, so yeah, they uh, they they basically gave people these three beverages and and looked to see like how they impact different re- reward centers of the brain and whatnot. Uh, but also on a much more practical level, um, two hours after they consumed these beverages, uh, they consumed an ad libitum meal with kind of a a buffet style eating uh, setup. So, you know, people could get a bunch of different foods and just eat as much of them as they felt like they wanted to eat. Um, And they were looking at the impact following water, sucralose or sucrose ingestion on food intake. And so uh, they did find that on average, uh, comparing the sucrose and sucralose conditions, that subjects at the ad libitum meal did consume more calories following the sucralose condition than the sucrose condition. So that is consistent potentially with the idea that artificial sweeteners might increase food cravings or like the the sweetness doesn't come with calories. And so it's not as satisfying as it could be. And then that might make people want to eat more at a subsequent meal. Uh, And they also found that there was a sex effect. So when they stratified it by sex, they found that uh, relative to the sucrose condition, the male subjects didn't eat more following the sucralose beverage, but the female subjects did. They ate about 100 calories on average more um, following a sucralose sweetened beverage than a sucrose sweetened beverage. So that's, again, seems consistent with the idea that Ah, maybe uh, maybe artificial sweeteners are no good. Maybe it increases appetite or food cravings or whatever. Uh, but as I mentioned, the devil is in the details here. And the piece of information that I haven't shared with you yet is the sucrose sweetened beverage contained about 300 calories. And so 
in total, combining the calories consumed in the beverage and the calories consumed in the subsequent meal, the male subjects consumed about 300 fewer calories uh, in the sucralose condition than the sucrose condition, and the female subjects consumed about 200 total fewer calories, uh, again, counting both the meal and the beverage. Um, so with that context, uh, in total, the sucralose condition did actually result in a relatively lower total energy intake. Um, compared to the sugar. C compared to the sugar. Um, and so, like, I don't know. To me, I, I care about that maybe more than uh, <laughs> uh, brain imaging research. Like, you know, if, if people are given the opportunity to eat everything they want to eat, and they're still consuming overall fewer calories following artificial, artificially sweetened beverages than sugar sweetened beverages. That still seems to suggest to me that um, at minimum, the artificial sweeteners are fine <laughs> when it comes to uh, uh, promoting overall energy intake. And sounds like you're going to say something. Well, I was just going to say, you could argue that this is evidence of kind of the ideal use case for a artificially sweetened beverage mm -hmm. where it's like oh for the totality of this meal if you swap this beverage it will still taste nice but your total calories will be lower yeah so that's pretty good i agree uh and, and to be clear the beverage wasn't consumed with the meal it was consumed but two yeah. hours prior but yeah i i agree conceptually uh so anyway i don't find the results of this study to be particularly scary or <laughs> to suggest that the artificial sweeteners, you know, enhanced appetite or cravings to a degree that would likely be deleterious. Uh, and I'll note that that is also in keeping with a meta-analysis that was published last year by Laviata Molina and colleagues. Title was Effects of Non-Nutritive Sweeteners on Body Weight and BMI in Diverse Clinical Contexts, Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. That will also be linked in the show notes, uh, but it, it's straightforward. They just looked for all of the RCTs that ran for at least four weeks that compared a non-nutritive sweetener, which um, I tend to just call artificial sweeteners. Uh, not all of them are artificial. Sugar alcohols aren't artificial, but whatever. It's what people would often refer to as artificial sweeteners. Uh, so it compared uh, studies lasting at least four weeks, um, comparing non-nutritive sweeteners versus either sugar-sweetened beverages or water um, as, as a uh, control condition. And it found that uh, kind of in, in all of the studies pooled together, non-nutritive sweeteners led to uh, negative effects on body weight. And I mean that negative in a numeric sense. So uh, either less weight gain or greater weight loss. Then when they broke it down further, just for example, just looking at the studies, comparing it against sucrose versus studies comparing non-nutritive sweeteners against water, they found that the effect of water and non-nutritive sweeteners or, or not beverages sweetened with non-nutritive sweeteners they had similar effects on body weight. So uh, water did not have superior effects, uh, in other words, but neither did non-nutritive sweeteners. And then compared against sucrose, non-nutritive sweeteners did lead to a numerically negative impact on, on body weight and BMI. Um, and then they also looked at the type of dietary intervention. So in uh, restricted intervention, so like when people were put on a diet that was intentionally reduced calorie for the purpose of, of losing weight, um, it didn't really seem to matter what sort of beverages they consumed. Like non-nutritive sweeteners did not uh, enhance weight loss in those studies, but they also didn't have a negative impact in, on weight loss in those studies. But then in studies with uncontrolled diets, they did have a significant uh numerically negative impact on body weight and BMI. So, you know, um, again, I, I care less about brain imaging than a meta-analysis that's actually looking at changes in body weight and BMI over time. And in that context, uh, non-nutritive sweeteners seem to be uh, neutral to positive if you're interpreting either greater weight loss or uh, less weight gain as, as a positive uh, effect. The one thing that I will note, uh, just as, as a caveat, and I wouldn't say potential calls for concern, but just kind of a, a thing to look out for potentially. 
um, is, you know, there are a bunch of non-nutritive sweeteners or, or artificial sweeteners out there. Um, so the, the study I started uh, talking about initially for the segment um, looked at sucralose, again, brand name there is Splenda. Uh, but most of the research in this area looks at aspartame. And then there are also various sugar alcohols. A um, couple of studies look at uh, saccharin. Yeah. And honestly, I don't even call saccharin an artificial sweetener. It's not sweet. Like, I don't care what people say. Saccharin's not sweet. It just tastes like shit. Uh, same <laughs> thing with stevia. Stevia is not an artificial sweetener. It's an artificial bitterer. Uh, like I, I've seen here. Okay. Here, here's I the, I think they call that one a non-artificial bitterer. Yeah. Whatever. Stevia. I don't care. So th this is, um, the thing that I think I get the most heated about when it comes to like diet culture and people trying to make like healthy desserts and whatnot, like, cause there, there's the, the high protein dessert community and the people with <laughs> undiagnosed orthorexia community is a circle i believe and so there's a lot of kind of like health halo stuff around like oh natural is good stevia it's natural it's not it's not like aspartame it's not like sucralose so like yeah make these little fucking protein balls and use three cups of stevia and like it's gonna be sweet and it's gonna be great and then like you know people will be like oh man, like, uh, it's not quite as good as the real thing, but I still like it. You're lying to yourselves. No one likes stevia. Stevia tastes terrible. Uh, if you want, I don't generally do plugs if I'm not getting paid. I'm not sponsored by Splenda, but honestly, <laughs> the next time you make one of those fucking recipes, sub out the stevia for Splenda or just like a store brand of sucralose, I promise you, it's going to taste so much better. Stevia is terrible. And uh, if you if you don't agree with me, you're lying to yourself. And I, I will not hear arguments to the contrary. Anyway, to getting back on topic. Uh, yeah, th there are a lot of sweeteners that kind of fall under the umbrella of non-nutritive sweeteners. And what I'll note is the meta-analysis I just talked about looking at weight and BMI. Um I don't, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but if memory serves, like 80% of the studies were aspartame studies. Like aspartame is far and away the most well-studied non-nutritive sweetener. And I believe that only one of the studies in that meta-analysis did look at sucralose. So it, it would be fallacious to necessarily assume that the impact of all non-nutritive sweeteners on hunger or appetite or weight or BMI are all identical. Um, I'm not arguing that. So it is possible that the impact of sucralose on weight and BMI over time might differ from the effects of aspartame. Um, but, you know, so, so th that is a door that's still open. But the, uh, the, the study that the NPR article was about that, that, uh, I was asked about on Facebook. It's not sufficient for me to become scared of sucralose or to think that it it would have a negative impact on uh, on weight over time. Yeah, and and by the way, the same is true. A lot of times, people ask about how uh, non nutritive sweeteners impact the gut microbiome. That's another area of research where there are many studies on it. Uh, not a ton, but there are several. But again, it's very aspartame dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we definitely need more research looking at some of the other popular non-nutritive sweeteners. But this study, um, and this is not um, to be critical of the original researchers because they had a very practical component to their study. Um, but one of the things that, that I get a kick out of is when you have conversations, usually on the internet, um, and someone will be using mechanistic data to make conclusions about an applied outcome when we absolutely definitely do have applied research on mm -hmm. the topic. You know, like I saw a thread the other day where someone was like, oh, dude, carbs are so bad. And I was like, how do you know that? And they're like, look at this study from five decades ago when they infused insulin. <laughs> I'm like, dude, these people didn't even eat a carb. Yeah. What, like, what are you what are you going on about? Yeah. Uh but yeah, it's the same kind of thing where like sometimes I'll, I'll look at these extrapolations of mechanisms that often tend to lean in the scary direction. And I'm like, 
dude, you know, we know what happens when, <laughs> when people eat that, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, uh, and, and that's not to say that mechanistic uh, data is not informative or helpful or important, but like, if we have actually seen what humans do in a very specific context, and that's what your question is about, mm -hmm. it's okay to also use some of that data too. What, one of, an uh, in instance of that that I previously found very funny, and I don't say I don't say previously because I no longer find it funny, but I say previously because I don't see people making this exact claim anymore. But whatever, I'm going to put some people on blast in the past. Uh, so it used to be maybe like five or six years ago, people would use um, acute muscle protein synthesis research to make very firm arguments about training frequency. And I, I personally did this a little bit as well. Um, not to an extreme degree, but I'm, I'm slightly putting uh, a past version of myself on blast. So consider this uh, a slight contextual clarification uh, for me as well. But anyway, um, so yeah, you, you look at uh, you look at research looking at protein synthesis following resistance training in trained lifters, and oftentimes you you will only see elevations in muscle protein synthesis. Uh, after a resistance training bout lasting 12 hours or 24 hours. And from that, I didn't make claims quite this extreme, but I, I did see this exact claim. Like, look, as far as training frequency goes, if you're only hitting a muscle once per week, you're building muscle one day per week and you're losing muscle six days per week. You will at best tread water, but there's really no way to build muscle with a training frequency of just once per week. It has to be at least two or three times per week. But honestly, every day is probably best because <laughs> th these elevations are like maybe 24 hours yeah. tops. And it's like, brother, there's there's a lot of research here. <laughs> like a, a lot. I would say a at the time, probably a majority of the longitudinal resistance training studies used a per muscle training frequency of once per week. These days, I think the average is is closer to twice per week in the research. But back then, man, most of the research on resistance training, you were looking at per muscle frequencies of once per week. And it's like, they're growing, man. They're getting, yeah. they're getting bigger. Uh, so yeah, it, like it, extrapolating acute results to uh, long-term assumptions that are fully contradicted by an enormous amount of research. Uh, e even at the time when I was very much on the high frequency train, I was like, some of y'all need to cool your jets. Like you, yeah. you can't, you can't go that far with it. Yeah.